Good morning. Welcome to our worship on this final Sunday of the Easter season. During this Easter season, we have been noting the things that our Savior gives to us. And today we are going to be considering the fact that our Savior, who has now ascended on high, gives to us protection and hope in the midst of our struggles. And so today, as we focus on our second lesson once again today, we've had a series of readings for 1 John. John assures us that in the course of all of this, we have victory. And the assurance of that victory is the fact that we have been born of God. And we will see the evidence of that new birth in us, um, which brings to us confidence as we proceed through this life until that final victory is obtained in heaven. So with those thoughts in mind, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we have gathered for worship on this final Sunday of the Easter season, we bask in the wonderful truth that you give to us protection and hope through the power of your word. Today, help us to always be confident of the victory that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ, that nothing might diminish our faith or our hope, and that we might proceed through the course of this life, giving daily a bold confession of your name to the world, confident that in the end we have the victory in your kingdom. Be with us today in our worship with the presence of your spirit as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Let's begin our worship with our opening hymn, hymn 935.
Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all your sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, was taken up in glory and intercedes for us at your right hand. Through your living and abiding word, give us hearts to know him and faith to follow where he has gone who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture readings for today are the readings for the final Sunday of this Easter season, Easter 7. And in our readings for today, we are reminded of the potential Struggles that we face as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, but again, the victory that we are assured of through our risen and ascended Lord and Savior. And in our first scripture lesson from the book of Acts, chapter 6, and also chapter 7, we see that we may, if we hold faithful to the word, end up losing our life, as we promise at our confirmations to rather lose our life than abandon the truth. We see this in the life of Stephen. In those days, as the number of disciples was increasing, a complaint arose from the Greek-speaking Jews against the Hebrew-speaking Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called together the whole group of disciples and said, It is not right for us to neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, carefully select from among you seven men with good reputations, who are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will put them in charge of this service. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the entire group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God kept on spreading and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly. Also a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Some men who were from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. Stephen said, gentlemen, brothers and fathers, listen, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. You are doing just what your forefathers did. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who prophesied the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You who received the law as transmitted by the angels, but did not keep it. When they heard these things, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. 
He said, look, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they screamed at the top of their voices, covered their ears and rushed at him with one purpose in mind. They threw him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell to his knees and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. After he said this, he fell asleep. The word of the Lord. The next scripture we consider are the words which are our sermon text for today from 1 John chapter 5. We begin reading at verse 1, where John says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves, who loves the God who was, has given birth also loves the one who has been born of him. This is how we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commands. In fact, this is love for God, that we keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, because everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by the water alone, but by the water and by the blood. The Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. orphans I will come to you Alleluia 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 Please rise for a reading from the Gospels Today's gospel reading is a portion of Jesus' high priestly prayer found in John chapter 17. We begin with the second half of verse 11, where Jesus prays on behalf of his people, Holy Father, protect them by your name which you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I kept those you gave me safe in your name. I protected them, and not one of them was destroyed except the son of destruction, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I am saying these things in the world, so that they may be filled with my joy. I have given them your word. The world hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world." I am not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We continue now with hymn 446.
As we rest assured of the victorious life that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, we turn today to, once again, the words of our second lesson for today from John's first epistle. Today's lesson comes from chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. I'll just read verses 1 and 2 again. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the God who has given birth also loves one who has been born of him. This is how we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commands. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today, on this last Sunday of the Easter season, as we continue to celebrate the victory we have in your Son, Jesus Christ, make us confident of this victory as we face the struggles of this life. Let your Spirit fill our hearts with a deep love and desire to grow in your word so that our lives might display you in all that we do. Let that be true of our study today as we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. During this Easter season, what have we seen? In our themes, we have seen that Jesus gives us something. Since Good Shepherd Sunday, we have seen, first of all, that the Good Shepherd relates to his disciples as a shepherd tends his flock. Then we saw that he relates to us as a vine relates to the branches. And then we saw that Jesus imparts to us, gives to us a love that imitates the same love that he has had for us. On this last Sunday of the Easter season, we see our high priest doing what for us? Well, what a priest did. A priest stood between God and his people, interceded for the people in the presence of God. Today in our gospel reading, we saw how Jesus goes to the Heavenly Father on our behalf for what purpose? What is he asking the Father for? He's asking for our protection. You see, his mission was soon to be over. He's going to the cross on the very next day, isn't he? And after this, he is going to be leaving for a while. This past Thursday marked once again the fact that Jesus, after he came back to life, spent 40 days with his disciples and now has returned to his Father, continuing to demonstrate his power, his power that he now uses seated at the right hand of his heavenly Father, where he continues to do what? Intercede for us. But even though he's not going to be here, present here on earth, he doesn't mean that he is no longer concerned about us, that he no longer cares about us, that he no longer is invested in us. The hatred that he was going to experience in an enormous way on the very next day on the cross was going to be transferred from him to anyone who faithfully followed him. He's going to leave. But as our gradual stated for today, that phrase that we sung in between our epistle reading and our gospel reading, he wasn't going to leave us as orphans. Next Sunday, we celebrate the wonderful gift of the giving of the Spirit. And what does the Spirit work through? That thing that he has given to us, which is our weapon against all of the enemies that we face. A sure weapon, a strong weapon. And that is the truth of his word. That word is what we use to fend off our enemies. That word preserves us in our faith and keeps us solid as God's people. In our first lesson for today, we see the danger that we face as we profess his word faithfully in the world. We see that in the life here of Stephen. Stephen, as we heard this morning, was one of seven men that had been chosen by the apostles to carry out the work of distributing food to the widows there in their community. But Stephen's work went beyond that, if you noticed in our reading. He didn't just distribute food to these people. He spoke the word of God and performed miracles. The Holy Spirit was working powerfully through this man. His sharing of the truth eventually brought what? Opposition. Fierce opposition. He is attacked. 
He is arrested and brought before this same ruling body that would convict Jesus and assign him a death on the cross. There before this ruling body of Jews, it's an unbelievable thing what he does. I've often said I do not think that many homiletic teachers would suggest that you begin a sermon the way that he began his message before this hateful group of people. Stiff-necked, he called them. Murderers, he referred to them as. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the word that was resting in his heart, he gave this testimony that was clear and bold and concise and faithful to God's word. And what did it incite? Even more hatred. Because what did our reading tell us? They became furious. They were literally out of control. They covered their ears. They screamed at the top of their lungs. They grabbed Stephen and they take, them out of, take him out of town. And then they begin to pelt him with stones until his life is gone. But in the midst of this, did you notice his demeanor? He doesn't become hateful. He does not panic. Instead, he remains calm. He remains at peace. He calmly and confidently entrusts his life into what? Into the hands of, the, of, the, of his father. He says, Father, I give you my spirit. He, what you see here in him is an imitation of Jesus at the cross. And Jesus is further imitated in the final words that he speaks. Father, don't hold this against them. Jesus acknowledges this type of danger for all of his disciples in the gospel reading for today. Even while he was here on this earth, the faith of the disciples required protection from attacks from the enemies of the gospel. And now that he was about to return to the Father, they would remain here and they would take over that challenge of sharing the gospel to the ends of the earth, of remaining faithful to that gospel, watching their doctrine closely as Paul would encourage a young pastor by the name of Timothy. And it did not take long at all for the sharing of that gospel message boldly and confidently in public settings to attract negative reaction. They would be hated by the world because of the word of truth that had now been entrusted to them. In his prayer, Jesus does not pray to the Father to take these men out of the world. They must remain in the world so that the gospel message might be shared. But what he does pray is for their protection. And the key to that protection was found in what Jesus had brought to the world. That was the truth of the Father, the word of the Father. And so we have those well-known words, sanctify them, set them apart. Make them different from the world. Make them have convictions of the truth. Do it through the word. His prayer was is that as he left, they would continue to make this bold confession in the face of opposition and that ultimately the Father would protect them and bring them where? Bring them to their eternal home. We have been considering a series of readings here in this Easter season from John's first epistle. And what has he been doing? In this epistle, he has been exposing the unbelieving world as the enemy of our faith, the enemy of us carrying out our lives as God's people. He shows us that those who love the world, those who love the things of this world, those who love the philosophies and the ideologies of this world do not in any way have the love of the Father in them. He reminds us that the world is something that is temporary. It's passing away. He reminds us as well that there are those who have gone out into the world, false prophets, who are now speaking things that are contrary to this word of truth. And today he shows us that those who are truly born of God, those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, have conquered this ugly and hateful word, through faith. Faith that is only found in the powerful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
In the face of these attacks that you and I are going to face, if we truly are children of God, and that is a, an absolute truth, if we are children of God and we live out our faith, we will be attacked. And Satan has stepped up his game because he knows his time is short. And he is pulling out all the stops to try to separate us from that love of God that is in Christ Jesus. But we have this confidence that we can stand our ground because of what? The thing that he has entrusted to you and to me. And that truth is his word. And if we stand in the truth of his word and have faith in what he has given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, then this is what we know. God's people are victorious. It is not an uncommon thing for doubt and uncertainty to begin to creep into our lives and to attempt to sever us from the relationship that we have with our risen Savior. I mean, think about, for instance, Peter. Peter is out on the Sea of Galilee with the other disciples. There is an intense storm, and suddenly the disciples see Jesus out there walking on water. Jesus invites Peter to come out and join him. And joyfully, he steps over the side of the boat, and he is walking on water. But all of a sudden, he becomes more aware of what's going on around him. The intense storm, the waves, the fact that he knows you don't walk on water. And the moment he takes his eyes off Jesus, fear enters in his heart. Doubt enters into his heart and he begins to sink. Or we think about during this Easter season, one of Jesus' disciples by the name of Thomas. Thomas was blessed to hear from the other disciples, even though he had not been present that first night, that Jesus was very much alive. This should have filled him with joy, should have filled him with confidence, should have filled him with a sense of victory, but instead, it filled him with doubt. As a result, not only did he experience doubt, but he was robbing himself of the joy that he had in a risen Savior, and fear began, continued to control his life until the next week when he was able to see Jesus face to face. The world around us and our sinful flesh within promotes uncertainty. Uncertainty in the lives of us as God's people. As Stephen faced off, with these people who had an intense hatred for the message of the gospel, we face the same type of attacks if you and I are not going to hide our faith under a bushel basket, but instead let the world see it as a light to the world, what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, and testify to him clearly and boldly. We live in a world that's filled with so-called intellectual experts. These intellectual experts do some time to take some time to study, okay? These intellectual experts are some of the key causes to the greatest harms of civilization and the disasters that have been created, and we've seen that recently. They are looked to, looked up to, worshipped. Their word is just taken for granted. And when we contradict these so-called experts of the world with the truth of God's word, what do they attempt to do? They attempt to shame us. Who are you to question us? You believe in this foolish book called the Bible? This God that you cannot prove that exists? We are mocked as we're attacked by the world. When we fight with the wisdom of the world that seeks to destroy everything that is good and pleasing to the Lord, what can happen to us? We can begin to get down. We can begin to be filled with fear. And we might look at the world in a despairing way. John answers these doubts that so easily can come into our lives and the uncertainties that can rule them by doing what? By describing to us what a follower of Jesus Christ really looks like, and assuring us that if we are in Christ, then we are victorious over these people, no matter what it looks like. 
He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the God who has given birth also loves one who has been born of him. You know, when you and I came into this world, the government issued us a birth certificate. And the birth certificate is basically assuring the world we're alive. And during the course of our lifetimes, we have to produce that birth certificate every once in a while to give proof that we are indeed alive. But the, even though we have this birth certificate that says, hey, this person is alive, guess what? We were dead. I've often said to people, as you know, we hold that newborn child in our arms and we're so happy, we have a smile on our face, we're rejoicing over this new life. I wonder how many people have ever s stood there and held this child and thought, I'm holding death. Because that's exactly what you're doing. You're holding someone who is spiritually dead. Why? Because they have received from their parents a sinful nature. Jesus said this to Nicodemus. He said, Amen, amen, I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Why? Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of a sinful human being is sinful. That's true of all of us. That's why Paul, in writing not only to the Ephesians, but to the Colossians, but I quote the Ephesians here, a well-known verse of Scripture, that when we are born, what? We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Lifeless, straight line. No pulse. No hope. Coming to this life spiritually, it's going to require what? It's going to require a miracle. It's going to require something that we cannot do, but God can. And that is why John says that if we believe in Jesus, this is proof of the fact that we have been born of God. He has, gin, has given to us the gift of life. He alone makes it possible for us to see our sin, to truly understand the seriousness of our sin, to truly see our helplessness, that we are like that jailer in Philippi falling at the knees of Paul and Silas and saying, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Because I see no hope here. I have no power to save myself. He alone has the power and ability to reveal to us where our salvation comes from. Where does it come from? It comes from the perfect life of Jesus. He does something that we are nowhere capable of doing, following these commands of God perfectly, and then taking the command of God and going to the cross and assuming the guilt of the world, and they're paying with his holy precious blood for all the sins of the entire world, assuring us of that in his resurrection from the dead and sealing the deal with his ascension into heaven. The ability to believe alone comes from God by the power of the Spirit that John says seals this to us. Paul, in writing about this gift of faith, says, Therefore I am informing you that no one, speaks by God's, no one speaking by God's Spirit says, A curse be upon Jesus. And no one, no one, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, when we believe in Him as our Lord and Savior, what do we have proof of? We have proof of the miraculous work of God in our lives. And so Paul would tell the Roman Christians, certainly if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and it is with the mouth that a person confesses, resulting in salvation. For Scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And so it is that the, uns that the uncertainty of our new birth in Christ is further diminished when we take a look at now what this results in, this new birth produces in our lives. So John goes on. He says, this is how we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commands. In fact, this is love for God, that we keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, because everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. You know, in life... From a worldly perspective, in some way or another, 
we reflect the image of someone from our past. Someone will say about, well, he looks just like his father. Or he acts just like his father. Or she just acts. And it could be he acts like his mother. You know, it could be a whole mixture of things. I walked into, I walked into a, a hospital room one time, and the gentleman did not have his glasses on, and I'd never seen him without his glasses on. I saw his face, and I thought, this is his grandson. I never noticed it. There's someone else here. I won't mention his name, but I, the same thing was true with his son one day. All of a sudden, bam! As God's children, we are to represent him. We, there, we are, people are to see him in us. You see, that's what John is saying here. Jesus said, so then if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. God's people, as God's people, who do we love? We love God. And because we love God, this love which has come from him, been created in us by the power of the Spirit, we want to conform our lives to his will, which is found in his word. What is that life going to look like? Paul laid it out in Galatians. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in step with it. Do you see, our lives are totally different from the world. And when we look at God's will, as it is laid out in the Bible, we don't say like the rebellious child, yeah, mom and dad are only making these rules for me because they want to take all the fun out of my life. No. God didn't give us his commandments to take all the fun of our life. He gave us his commandments so that we may gain knowledge, that we might be blessed, that we might find happiness. The Psalms speak in these terms, particularly Psalm 119. Just look at a sampling. Verses 15 and 16. I will meditate on your precepts and I will consider your paths. In your statutes I do what? I delight and I will not forget your words. The 35th verse. Make me walk on the path of your commandments for I take what? Pleasure in them. Verse 40. How I long for your precepts. Not ignore them, not look at them as little as possible. How I long for your precepts. Give me life in your righteousness. So, uh, verse 98, your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies because it is always with me. You see, as God's children, we will desire to live as our heavenly father. And this is proof and makes us confident of the work of the spirit in our lives that we are truly the children of God. And in this, we find our what? We find our victory. Who is the one who overcomes the world, John says? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. How do we know that Jesus overcame the world? How do we know that he destroyed sin, death, and the devil? Because on the third day, he was not rotting in the grave. He was very much alive. And not just alive, but he was glorified, restored back to his present situation and not only that it was sealed in the fact that now in that same power that God used to raise him from the dead he now has brought Jesus back to heaven where he sits at the right hand of the heavenly father ruling everything in our best interest and so the writer to the Hebrews says to us so then we say with confidence the Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid what will man do to me in other words we have nothing to be afraid of because we are what victorious Victorious in the one who has victory over all the forces of evil. The world cannot harm us. You say, well, the world can take our lives. So what? So what? This is temporal. Remember I just mentioned that a while ago? John's teaching us that this, this in this letter. This is temporal. This is not our home. Our home is with the Lord in heaven. You still want to, you still want to, you want to, you want to struggle forever with, you know, the, the, the tests that the doctors and finding you got this wrong with you, that wrong with you. The next thing you know, you're in the hospital. Uh, they're telling you that you only have so many months to live. This is what you want, the attacks from the world? Or do you want to be with the Lord where there are none of these things? None of these things trouble us. We are walking in victory as we make our way where? To our final home, to our final victory. 
This victory has come to us through the word and sustains us through that same powerful message of the gospel. This is the one who has come by, came by water and blood, John says, Jesus Christ. He did not come by the water alone, but by the water and by the blood. The Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. The Spirit has created this new life in us by the power of God's gospel message, the gospel that comes to us in word and sacrament. And not only does He create this new life in us, He sustains it and He strengthens it. Jesus prayed what in our gospel reading? He said, sanctify them, make them holy and set them apart from the world. How? By your truth. Where do we find that truth? Your word is truth. You, as a child of God, are not part of the world. You've been set apart from it. By the power, not of your thinking, not of your choosing, as Luther said, but by the power of the Holy Spirit through the gospel. Our walk with Jesus is made more certain, is made more obvious as we grow in our wisdom and understanding and our love for him and our love for one another. What does that look like? Here's a few examples. Rejoicing in the life and hope and forgiveness that we have through Christ. Staying loyal to Jesus in spite of Satan's attacks on our daily life. Resisting the devil knowing that he has to flee, as James spells out in the fourth chapter of his epistle. Adopting not the world's value system, not my value system, but God's value system instead of the attractive human philosophies. And I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago. We are a world that is being led by philosophies, not led by religion, not led by Jesus Christ. Using and enjoying things. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the things that God has given to us in this world, but never becoming materialistic. In other words, that's the center of our lives. We endure pain and hardship. Resisting despairing. Resisting becoming bitter against God. And in the end, we rise from the dead to eternal life on judgment day. The hymnist wrote, I walk in danger all the way. And that's something we need to be aware of. Every day we face danger. But we are not to despair. Why? Because as we face this danger on a daily basis, someone else walks with us. The same one who became one of us, even though he was God, he became one of us, took our place, and he has gained the victory over these evil forces at work in the heavenly realms. He's victorious, we are victorious. And our victorious Savior walks with us all the way so that we are indeed safe and secure. That same hymnist went on to write, I walk with Jesus all the way. His guidance never fails me. Within his wounds I find a stay when Satan's power assails me. And by his footsteps led, my path I safely tread. No evil leads my soul astray. I walk with Jesus all the way. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join now in making confession of our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate to the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please remain standing. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, by the power which you alone possessed, power that is limitless, you put together the plan that alone could rescue us from our sin, from death, and the power of Satan. In your love you sent your Son, and in his love he goes to Calvary, and there he redeems us, buys us back, pays the price with his holy precious blood, and that price was sufficient because as we have celebrated during these seven weeks of Easter, he is indeed alive again. But even more so, seated at your right hand, continuing to care for us and intercede for us as we face the dangers of this world. We truly know that we are one of your disciples when we face the hatred of the world because of our bold confession of faith. Help us not to become discouraged in our walk with you, but to remind us that these things are to be expected Give us hearts and minds that are truly focused on your word. Give us hearts and minds that desire to learn, to study, to be together with our fellow Christians, to continue to grow that we might encourage one another on a path that leads to our final victory with you in heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with Bill Fryer and Bill Schilke this week. Um, Bill Fryer, we thank you that he is scheduled to be released from rehab this coming Thursday, and we pray that his improvement will continue. We also thank you that you saw Bill last Sunday safely through his surgery and now is on the road to recovery. We pray that you will help those attending him to figure out now these steps going forward for rehabilitation. Help him not to become discouraged, but to always find hope and joy and strength in the message of the gospel. And dear Heavenly Father, today as um, we gather here, we are reminded of the gifts of our mothers. Today is our national holiday of Mother's Day. It, it is such a blessing, the mothers that you have given to us, who not only you use to give us life so that we might be here physically, but you also use them so that we might come to know Jesus as our Savior. Their work is long, is tiresome, sometimes overwhelming. We pray that you will fill their hearts with a rich measure of your love and assurance that they do not carry this out by themselves, but you are with them to sustain them and to strengthen them. We pray that in our families you will give us mothers that boldly confess the truth of your word, who do, not resi that, who do resist the things of this world, who have the boldness to correct their children when they are, not they are not right, when they stray from the truth of your word, to be there in love, to rejoice with them when they confess, and to encourage them on a path that displays your love in their lives. Bless our mothers not only on this day of the year, but always. We ask these things in our Savior's name, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. During the distribution of the Lord's Supper, the congregation will sing hymn 675.
Please rise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we pray, we give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We close today's service with hymn 924, singing stanzas 1 and 6. Mm -hmm.